I often start my stories with um, a story, if this is starting to work, yeah. Um, and the story starts in the forest. In the middle of the forest, all the animals are coming together because they're kind of worried. And why are they worried? Well, they kind of like eavesdropped with the humans. And when they were eavesdropping on the humans, they found out that human beings should be worried about the future. Because the future is coming and, and what are we going to do with our young? So now the animals will read as well. What are we going to do with our young for the future? But they also eavesdropped with the human beings to find out what they should do about that future. And the solution to prepare your young for that future, that is scary, um, is to send them to school. So the animals to come together and they're going to decide, we're going to start the school of the forest. So. There's this big gathering in the middle of the forest because they're going to decide what's on the curriculum. What should we teach our young? So the deer are saying, well, running, you know, what else than running? Well, the squirrels say, no, climbing and collecting nuts. And then the, the ducks, you know, flying and, and, and swimming and the fish are about swimming. And like they're having this massive discussion to have the curriculum. So what do they do? They put everything in. A little bit of running, a little bit of walking, a little bit of climbing, a little bit of gathering nuts. Everything is in there. So after summer, because that's what you do with a school, you start after summer, of course. So after the summer, all the animals come together. You've got like a little deer and a little duck and a little squirrel, and they're all there together, excited to begin the school. So the first topic is running. So deer happy, running along. Squirrel having a hard time keeping up. Duck quite annoyed by now, but they're still doing okay. Next topic is climbing trees. So, squirrel happy going all the way up. Um, well, deer are standing there like, well, this is not going to be my subject. Um, duck gets disqualified because it's climbing lesson, it's not flying lesson. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, he's getting a failing grade. But after a while, some problems start showing up. Because after 20 running lessons, the swimming doesn't go so well for the duck anymore because his feet are starting to hurt. And our squirrel is a little bit traumatized from being thrown in the water every time. And so there, there are some problems in the forest, but no, no worries. So they're really curious at the end of the year, who's going to be the best prepared for the future? So at the end of the year, well, we've got some dropouts, fortunately, but well, that can be helped. And so now we've got the animals wondering who is best prepared for the future. And they find out the best prepared for the future is the weasel because he can run a little bit, he can climb a little bit, he can dig a little bit, he can swim a little bit, he can do everything a little bit. And what more could you want for your young than to have them know a little bit of everything? Could there be a metaphor in this story? <laughs> I found this other cartoon, by the way. Uh, maybe you've seen the picture. <laughs> Not the subtlest version. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, who's that guy coming to stand in front of you? My name is Tel Koendrink. Um, I started in education um, consulting or working with the gifted um, out of my own story as well. Um, I went to three different high schools after being kicked off of two of them. Um, and at the end of my high school, I failed my final exam in math. Um, while at the same time I was working for a software company as a software architect and that kind of blew my mind. I've also been tested and I'm mostly gifted in the analytical field, like far above. They called me hyper highly gifted for whatever that might mean. Um, but that really raised the question in me. How is that possible? How can somebody have proven talents, but the results, how can they be so awful at the same time? And that's been a question that's been been with me for my entire life. Um, I started an IT company, I did a lot of training in accelerated learning and creative problem solving. And at some point I got involved with an organization that was setting up full-time gifted uh, programs. And I was there as a trainer in the subject of entrepreneurship because I run my company for a couple of years and learning skills. Because the one question that, that was most on my mind during my school period is the question, how do you learn? Like, how do you do that? I know how like magical, magically stuff gets into my head when I'm interested, but I didn't know what to do when it didn't magically appear in my head. And so I followed a lot of training and so I was really happy working with gifted kids. So I was part of an, a movement that set up 15 different full-time gifted programs and that turned into NoFlow, which is um, an educational consulting company in the Netherlands, where together with 20 of my colleagues, um, we're guiding hundreds of schools in setting up gifted programs, doing teacher training, um, and pretty much from all different areas. And in that process, we also ran into an organization that unfortunately had to stop that 
was um, supporting gifted dropouts. Kids between 12 and 22 who completely lost their way. They were burned out, they were depressed, they didn't fit into a sc the school system anymore. And they were actually to the point that they were at home. They were sick, they were not, they were really kind of losing their way. So we set a program, uh, Phoenix, after the Phoenix, um, to make them rise from their ashes again, to find their talents and find an alternative path towards the future. Um, one of the things that kind of bugged me in that process is that a lot of the things that we're doing is um, adding things onto the regular education system for gifted kids. And what I think that's really important, uh, I'm one of the proofs of how wrong it can go in education. Part of me thinks that it's also the, that education hasn't been designed or redesigned properly. Um, I was just talking with Susan that one of the things that I often say is that um, education is the right answer but to the wrong question. It's the right answer to the question how do we prepare our kids uh, for the future if, this, if it's the 1970s. Um, it's just not the 1970s anymore. Um, so education could do with an upgrade and if education for instance would be perfectly differentiating um, we didn't need, we wouldn't need to talk about acceleration or skipping grades because this subject matter would be fitted to the individual. Um, if we didn't have a core curriculum with a lot of arbitrary subjects in it, but it was tailored to the talents of the individual, you didn't have, we wouldn't need to have all these different programs. So that's why we set up the School of Understanding um, to try to update education. I'm going to tell a little bit more about it later on in the presentation. And so my most two, two most recent activities have been um, GrowWise, setting up a software company to support all of this. So to create software to do what they call portfolio learning. So kids build up their portfolio and in creating a portfolio they prove what they're learning as opposed to having to take tests to prove what you're learning but have it be a more immersive process. And setting up Take on Talents, um, trying to spread these stories throughout the world and this is part of that, going to as many places as possible visiting different schools and sharing these stories. Um, what are we going to do? Um, I'm gonna first going to give a bit of an overview, some theory, but I really think it's important that we end up practical. That you guys go home with the idea that tomorrow you can try something with your kids that's going to be helpful. I think that's the most important thing. If you get nothing else, if you don't like the theories, as long as you get something you can try out and it works, then probably your life's going to be better for it. Um, I'm, you already hear like my speed of speech, I'm enthusiastic, I really like sharing a lot, I talk really fast, um, so cherry pick. You don't have to agree with everything, it doesn't all have to make sense, but just pick out what you like. Um, you see the devices, I record a lot of my trainings on video, um, this one as well. I'll share it with Paula to make sure that you guys can get the materials as well. So I see some people writing, which is really good, if that's your learning style, keep doing it. Uh, but if you're worried that you might miss something, I will make sure that you guys get the the presentation and the video afterwards. Uh, people said that they watch my video afterwards on YouTube at half speed and then it's a decent speed to listen to. <laughs> and you got twice as much material. So, then, all right. uh, I'll send some other materials as well. I've gave more presentations also on different subjects I'll talk about so that might be interesting too. And we'll do questions at the end. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a coherent talk. Um, just to prepare you guys, probably you're cool with it, but um, I'm going to talk to you, it's an evening, you guys are already tired. If I'm going to have long theoretical debates with you, you guys are all going to fall asleep. So when I can choose between telling a story or telling a very precise correct theory, I will always opt for the story. Know that if you have questions, I'll give you the theory, I'll tell you what books to read. But you know, yes, the world is more nuanced, I often make jokes or make fun of stuff. I know it's more nuanced than that, but this way we have more fun together and I think that helps learning as well. So, so forgive me for that, <laughs> I know the world is more nuanced. So this is usually the place in the presentation where the speaker will start about what is giftedness. And the reason that they always have to do that is because there are so many different theories about what giftedness is. So I'd almost be um, inclined to tell you what giftedness is. Um, this is just a bit of a challenge for me. Because if you um, look at the simplest model, and maybe you've seen this, um, this is Ranzulis, like one of the first models, and it only has three parts. Um, gifted kids, above average ability, they are creative, and they have task commitment. But this already kind of might give you a problem. And um, a Dutch cartoon, I've translated for your benefit, might um, indicate that. Fok and Sukke got the report card. Uh, oh wow, he's failing all subjects. Bad behavior, disruptive behavior. Um, hmm, you don't think he's gifted, is he? 
And some of you might recognize this, you know, that, oh yeah, that sounds pretty much like a gifted kid. But if we're going to take this model, then he can't be gifted. Because I'm not showing, seeing above average ability, I'm not seeing creativity, and I'm not seeing task commitment either. So if we're going to be gatekeepers and going to check all the boxes to make sure if you're there and then we're going to say, oh, well, you missed one of the three boxes, so you don't get into the gifted program. Hmm. If you're really talented and you're not looking like a talented kid anymore, would that be an indication of us needing to give you less guidance or should we give you more guidance? And I think it's the last one. Like if we've got a gifted kid that doesn't look like a gifted kid anymore, that gives us all the more reasons for us to start doing stuff to start helping them. So this approach, and this is the simplest model. I mean, if you go to Heller's or Garnier's model, you've got the 32 interrelated factors that might or might not lead to gifted behavior and, and, and performance. It might not always help. Um, I have a little bit of a different approach to it usually. And it's not that the other approach is wrong, but um, of course I'm gonna start by a, th a story and then I'm gonna add some theory to it. At some point I did a 10-day course, um, it was a 10-day meditation course, 10 days of not speaking I might add, um, you can imagine me, <laughs> 10 days not speaking, 10 hours of meditation a day and at the end of every day you got a story of the Guru Goenka, he would tell stories about the life of Buddha and the old India and one of the stories always stuck with me and it's a story about a mother in India with her three sons. And that mother was about to cook a meal and she found out she didn't have enough oil to cook that meal. So what do you do if you're a parent? You take one of your kids and you say, there's a marketplace, here's a vase, here's some money, please go get me some oil. So kid takes some money, takes a vase, he goes out to the market, he buys oil, comes back, but he trips. And he loses most of the oil and comes back to home to his mom and says, Oh, mama, mama, I fell and I lost a lot of my oil. This is the worst day ever. And so his mom's like, well, it's not that bad, but she didn't have enough oil for food. So time for sound number two. Here is the vase. Here's like the money. So the kid went out. He got the oil. He came back, but he tripped as well. And he comes back home to his mother and says, Mom, this is the coolest day ever. I fell. I saved some of the oil, the oil thing is in one piece, I'm in one piece, this is awesome! Well, his mom's like, well, it's not that cool. <laughs> um, and she still has a problem, not enough oil for a meal. So, son number three, he goes out, buys oil, comes back, trips as well. I think there's a motor skill problem in the family, by the way, but that's a different discussion. He comes back to his mom and he says, well, mom, um, I fell. Um, I lost some of the oil, I still have some of the oil, but what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna go back to the marketplace and I will work for this merchant for an hour and make enough money to buy new oil. And that's like three ways to look at life. The first one is a pessimist. Whatever happens, oh no, it's terrible. You know, are you gifted? Ah, oh, poor, sorry for you, man. <laughs> the second is the optimist. Everything is cool, everything is awesome. You're gifted, great. But I like the third one the best. It's not about it's awesome, it's not about it's awful. It is what it is, but the question is, what am I going to do to make things better? What am I going to do to improve things with the facts that are there? And that's, what I tend, that's the way I tend to look at the world. Accept reality as it is and wonder, what can I do to make things better? And if I could give parents and teachers and counselors only one question to use in life, the question would be, what are you going to do to make things better? And there's three important things in that. What are you? Because I'm a firm believer that the kid should remain responsible for his or her own problems. However much you want to, you cannot learn for your kid. He has to learn himself. So what are you going to do? So not talk about, not whine about, not gripe about. <laughs> what are you going to do? And not to make it perfect, but to make it better than it is right now. And if I'm in a really kind mood, then I might add, what are you going to do to make things better? What can I do to help you with that? But then it's kind of quite clear what the balance is. Your problem, you do stuff, making it better, and I'm gonna help you to do that. So to describe that in a little bit more technical terms, there are two types of diagnosis. On one hand, you've got classifying diagnosis. On the other hand, you've got operational diagnosis. Classifying diagnosis is about asking the question, what are you? And what are the characteristics of your class? Are you a gifted? 
Are you an artist or somebody with an autism spectrum disorder? Or what are you? And then what should you do with your class? If you are somebody with HDD, this is what we do with people with ADD. And so there's always a step in between. First, I need to know what you are before I know what I can do with you. But as most people know, people don't tend to fit that well into like little corners. Because I might have two kids as a teacher and both have ADD, or actually one has ADD and has officially reached the score of ADD. But it's functioning really well, he feels really good, he's he learned all kinds of coping skills, doesn't need anything. Kid next to him might just by one point not have reached the threshold of being officially labeled ADD, but he's got trouble mo uh, uh, concentrating, he's got like his, his mind is running away with him, he's getting all the cha challenges. So he has need for help. But because I had as a definition, first you have to fit into the like little pigeonhole and then I can help you, that runs into challenges. And the same with giftedness. You know, do we need to know if you're 129 or 133 or 147 and what tests we're gonna use and stuff like that? I tend to be more of the operational type. What do you need? How can we give it to you? You know, let's skip that step in between. Let's find out what the needs are and then let's find out how to support them. And this can help in that process to figure out what those needs are. So sometimes, you know, an IQ test might be very useful and might be a useful tool to differentiate. But the question is, what do you need and how can we give that to you? And the label is optional if it's functional. I'm not even sure for all kids, sometimes it's useful for all kids if it's useful for them to know if they're gifted. It has some functions. In some areas, that function is kind of irrelevant. So it all has to do with the goal you're trying to achieve. What are we trying to do? And <clears throat> so the approach depends on the goal. What is the goal? So one of the things, or one of the themes that we're gonna talk about tonight is social emotional needs. And one of the things that I always think is important is to take those two apart. Social development and emotional development are two different things. We, we tend to, especially in, in psychology, it always tends to kind of like stick together, like one social emotional. But social usually tends to, depending on the definition you use, tends to have, um, to encompass the skills you have to deal with social interactions. Emotional development is the range of emotions that you experience and, and how developed they are. But they don't need to match up. You have very socially skilled people with low emotional development. You have very emotionally developed people with relatively little social skill. So it's important to maybe take those two apart. And in that process, look for balance. Because I've heard people say about gifted kids, yeah, they're, they're all ahead. Hmm, don't think that all gifted kids are ahead in, um, in their development. But they're also not all of them are behind. I've seen both situations. But I've seen situations where people thought that the kid was behind and he was ahead. So one of the um, classic examples that's given often is um, there was like a kid, he's about four or five years old and he's standing at the end of the playground and he's really angry and he's shouting, it's not fair, I wanted to play with Johnny. And now the teachers are nodding their head like, oh, he hasn't learned how to play with others and he doesn't understand how, how playing with others works. But what actually happened was that this is little Pete and this morning he decided he wanted to play with Johnny. So in the morning when he came in, 8.30 sharp, he ran to Johnny, he said, we're gonna play this afternoon. And Johnny said, cool, let's do that. So Pete was ready all day to play with Johnny. By the time, you know, at the end of the day, everybody was going home, little Johnny didn't have a clue anymore. He forgot about it. So then somebody else asked him to play and he's like, cool. And then Pete's standing there at the end of the playground and he's seeing Johnny at the bike of another mom with another kid going to their house. And he's angry because we had made an appointment to play and he's not sticking to his agreement. That is actually a more complicated form of social interaction than most kids at this age can do. And now he's actually starting to analyze it in his head. Wow, man, how, what would somebody else need to do with me before I would be this mean? because actually Johnny was waving at him as he went by. Like I would have to hate somebody before. So what did I do wrong? He's making this entire analysis of, of all the group interaction. He's way ahead, but it looks like it's behind because somebody's only looking at his behavior at that point as opposed to asking him what's going on. Um, 
questions also about social behavior. Um, do, does it only count as social behavior if it's with peers or should it be with everybody? So what if other kids, you know, have an IQ of 40 points less than you do? And probably if you're going to look in your own environment, how many friends do you have that have 40 IQ points less than you do? If you look on average, most people will find their friends, I think, somewhere between like 10 points ahead, some 10 points behind. And that's not because we're mean, it's not because we hate other people, but one of the core parts of being friends with others is that others can understand your world and the stuff you're thinking about. And if you're seven years old and you're wondering about life and death, then the list of people you can talk to kind of shrinks dramatically. <laughs> There's not a lot of others that want to do that. Are you then an antisocial kid that you're not talking about your true feelings with others? No, it's just harder to find a match. And then you see kids that have been deemed antisocial and they come to a summer camp or something with other gifted kids and now they're suddenly the most social kids in the world. So does it only count if it's amongst each other or do you have to be sociable with everybody? And is being social, is that an inherent trait or is that a trainable skill? Well, you could have a long debate about that. Probably it's a big combination of both. Partly it's learned and, and inherit, partly it's inherited. So it's really important to look at this from different vantage points. So I'm going to go to some other things and then we're going to come back to this theme. Because we could really differentiate about types of gifted and talk about acceleration and levels of gifted and stuff like that. But it's all about classifying and tweaking it into the system again. And I take, tend to take a slightly more straight approach. Um, for, they say about the Dutch that we're really direct <laughs> and <laughs> to the point of being rude. But I think let's get straight to the point. What do we want? We want the kids to be successful and we want them to be happy. So why all the other things around it? Let's just wonder how do you get your kids to be happy and how do you get the kids to be successful? Um, so let's look at what is needed for that. And by the way, there are some universal themes here. You might want to apply it in your own life if it makes you happy. That's no problem. It's not illegal. <laughs> Getting happy is a good thing. Um, so what is needed for success and happiness? Um, I am going to redefine one word. I'm going to exchange happiness for well-being. Because happiness, it's kind of risky. Like, like we always should be happy always throughout life. I don't think that is necessarily a good goal. Um, not an achievable goal, probably. We have an entire range of emotions and sometimes even sad emotions can be really good for you. Um, so well-being is actually a better definition probably. So what is needed for well-being starts with the question, what, what is well-being? And I was really happy when I found the, the field of positive psychology. Positive psychology has been set up by Martin Seligman um, as a response to his conclusion that most of um, psychology, especially if you look around the year 2000 when it was founded, um, I think they did some study that said that about 98% of the studies in psychology is about all the ways people can be broken and how to fix them. And it's really predicated on the disease model, like what are all the diseases you can have. But then Seligman said, well, the interesting thing is that there are people who are not broken, according to the definition of psychology, but they're not happy either. And we've got people who are broken on seven different scales and they're happy as heck. So <laughs> somehow these two don't relate. And why is nobody researching how to be happier and how to function better? Let's make that our goal. So he actually did that. He set up the field of positive psychology, um, applied positive psychology actually to be able to do something with it. Uh, very interesting field. Um, Martin Seligman is the one who set it up. I can highly recommend for instance his TED talk uh, where he um, explains that. And he's also looked at for instance things like optimism and pessimism. So the research that he actually became famous with is about 50, 40, 50 years ago. He did a lot of research into learned helplessness. And learned helplessness is a phenomenon where um, people and animals, he actually did it with dogs uh, in the beginning, if they're put into a helpless position long enough, they will learn to be helpless and they will stop trying to improve their situation. But one of the things that was kind of like annoying for researchers is that some people and some animals, it's almost impossible to get them learned helpless. Uh, it's actually a good trait probably, but as a researcher it's kind of annoying because, you know, your data doesn't match up. Uh, but luckily it was statistically insignificant, so he could happily go on and do his studies. But later on he kept thinking like, how does that work? Like what's the difference between people who are immune to learned helplessness and people who are maybe even more sensitive to it? 
And that's when he came, for instance, with the differentiator between learned optimists and learned pessimists. A learned optimist, somebody who tends to look at things that are positive and attribute them to himself and thinks, whoa, positive stuff is happening to me often and when things go wrong things like well probably it won't be that bad it makes it smaller they tend to be pretty um, immune to learned helplessness and if you do the other the opposite so you're a learned pessimist if something bad happens you make it really big and you make it like this is going to be forever and when something goes right you're like well i'm, I'm lucky for a little bit a small area and you make it really small then then you're really vulnerable for learned helplessness so that's one of the first researches he did so one of the first questions he had to answer is what is happiness and that he quickly redefined to what is well-being so in this model, this is kind of like the popular psychology version. Again, the better story over the better theory. Um, we're first going to look at this version by Tony C. And I'm going to expand on it a little bit. Um, because what he was looking at is like, what types of happiness are there? What he found out in the for early research three, later five, there are three types of happiness. And the lowest form of happiness is rock star happiness. And rock star happiness is that I get what I want. So I want more money, I get more money, now I'm happy. Now I want a new car, I get a new car, now I'm happy. Um, I want a new house, I get a new house, now I'm happy. It's two problems with Rockstar happiness. One is um, it doesn't last very long. Uh, they've proven it over and over again with people wanting the, winning the lottery. Winning the lottery, within eight months, you're back to the same baseline happiness that you had before you won the lottery. Regardless how much money you won, regardless what you did with it, on average, within eight months, you have the same amount of happiness. I see some of you thinking, give me the money, I'll show you a better return. <laughs> but trust me, within eight months, same level of happiness. And the second problem is um, happiness inflation occurs. What was at one point enough to make you happy probably won't be enough later on. And if you doubt that, think about your first paycheck. How much work you had to do and how much money you got and how happy you were. And now imagining, imagine doing the same amount of work, getting the same amount of money. And if you're going to be equally happy as the time you got it the first time. Probably not. So now you need maybe three times or maybe even ten times as much money for exactly the same happiness. And actually the tricky thing is that in our society is built around this, around rock star happiness. And it's actually built around the idea that there will be one day where you will truly have everything you will ever, you've ever wanted and then you will be permanently happy. And that day will come, the day you have everything you ever thought you wanted. And that day is called the beginning of your midlife Christ. <laughs> because then you have everything you ever wanted and you're like, where is my happiness? I should have my happiness now. And well, of course, you've got like the guy solution, right? Red sports car, new, new girlfriend. <laughs> but yeah, eight months later, <laughs> it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really help, right? So you have to go for a higher level of happiness. You have to find it somewhere else. So you go for passion, flow and engagement. And it's a Hungarian researcher, Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly, beautiful name. Uh, we're going to test you afterwards if you can spell it. Uh, but he, um, he looked at flow. And he looked initially at uh, athletes and later on more people. Like how is it that some people put under extreme pressure and stress actually thrive? And they forget about time, they forget to eat, they forget everything because they're so involved in what they're doing. And what do you need for that? An appropriate challenge level, because if it's too hard, you get frustrated. If it's too easy, you get bored. And it should be a subject matter you're interested in. And if those two come together, then you can get into flow. And the cool thing is you can do this your entire life. You can be 70 and get into flow. And the recipe is always the same. You don't need more of something or it doesn't need to be more expensive or bigger. As long as you're doing stuff in an area you're interested at a decent challenge level, then you will get into flow. The highest level of happiness is higher purpose or meaning. When you get to the point that um, you really know why you're doing something and what the value of it is. Um, teachers don't always experience rock star happiness when they look at the paycheck. <laughs> um, doing, you know, <laughs> correcting work and stuff like that doesn't necessarily engage flow. But sometimes you've got like a group of students or even one student where you truly made a difference. Where you're like, if I hadn't been there, he wouldn't have made it. But because of what I did, he's got a different future. Or he got into the university he wanted to. Or he, he, I changed something about somebody's life. And that can keep you going for months. Regardless of how little rocks or happiness or flow you experience. So meaning is really important. Challenge is that if we're going to put this 
on the education system and a number of our students, the results aren't always as impressive. So I was talking to a student and I was asking, like, what, what's the end result of education? You know, what, what, what are we doing all of this for? And this, this is like a really cynical guy. He's like, well, I calculated the answer. I'm like, you calculated the answer to what the end of education is? He says, yes, it is six containers full of paper. Because he had calculated how many sheets of paper a week, how many weeks a year, how many years of education. So he's like, it's six containers of paper. And he says it's actually a pretty bad exchange rate because I've given them six containers of paper and I get like one sheet of paper back, my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow something's going wrong. But this shows actually the way he looked at education. He didn't see the meaning. He says it's like one big sandbox. I'm just building a new sandcastle and they, you know, tear it down again. And I build another sand castle and I tear it down. Like there's no point to what I'm doing here. Doesn't mean there can't be any. Doesn't mean that good education can provoke it. But a lot of these students don't really see it. Passion, flow and engagement. This happens if we've got a differentiated curriculum. If we can challenge students, if we can add and accelerate and do all these different things that are needed. But if that doesn't happen, maybe some of your students have had that in the past or before they got into a gifted program or something, if they don't experience flow, some kids don't even know what flow is. Because they're so smart, things come so easily. I asked a student, um, what do you think that learning is? What is learning? He said, well, then I'll look at a book, I'll fill out the test, and the teacher gives me an A+. Like, that's what learning is. I'm like, that's not what learning is, that's what knowing the answer is. <laughs> that's not learning. Learning is not knowing it and working to get there. He's like, never done that. Don't know what it is. And he, he was actually true. He wasn't being, like, boasting about himself and this was actually his experience because nothing had ever been challenging enough for him to really have to apply himself so he didn't know what passion flow and engagement is and then it's actually quite tricky to get into it because you need what they call frustration tolerance you'll be frustrated part of the time getting into flow so a lot of the kids drop, drop back to rocks or happiness only when you've got the character to stick will they move if you threaten punishment if you promise rewards, then they'll move for exactly the amount of energy required to get the reward. Because somebody said, intelligence can be um, defined as getting a maximum result for minimum effort. Well, if you start putting that over the school system, then you get a very efficient student. And we're wondering why isn't he doing more? Because he picked the most efficient route through the education system with a minimum amount of time. It's actually reasonably smart if you look at it from his or her perspective. Not a lot of long-term thinking going on, but it means that he hasn't found a higher version of motivation. So actually the more technical terms are the PERMA model, where they say you need positive emotions, so that's rocks or happiness, you need engagement or flow, we just talked about meaning, but in later research he uncovered two extra. One is you need accomplishments, we all need to feel that we accomplish something. We're doing something better than we did before. And it might be as superficial as reaching a new Candy Crush Saga level. Um, it might be more meaningful than that. But it's about reaching something that you haven't reached before. And the other one is um, experiencing positive relationships. When you experience a positive relationship, and that is a relationship in which you truly connect with somebody else and somebody else can understand your world, that can make you happy. And now looking at this, what I like about this model so much is that it makes it more operational. Because if I'm going to say, you know, add to the well-being of somebody or make somebody happier, motivate somebody, like that's virtually impossible. But if I'm going to ask the question, how can I engage more positive emotions? Okay, I can do stuff that is fun. How can I get more engagement? Well, tweak the challenge level, find an area they're interested, work on that. I can work on positive relationship, I can work on accomplishments, I can work on meaning. Now I can start doing stuff. So a little bit later on I'm going to give some suggestions on concrete stuff you could do to add to each of these factors. So this was well-being. The other question is how can we have kids be more successful? And especially if you're a student. So what is success? Um, it has to do with what you need. And it depends a little bit on the future you're pre preparing for. So say I'm trying to prepare somebody for a known future. Say um, I've got a kid 100 years ago, his dad was a farmer, he's going to be a farmer too. So it's a known future, we know exactly what his life is going to look like. If you know exactly what your life is going to look like, you need knowledge. You need the right answer. 
We need to spend time teaching you the right answer, and if you apply the right answer, we'll all be fine. But probably about 50 years ago, we found out there's a lot of occupations where the future is unknown. Because if you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be a lawyer, I can't give you the right answer. So you're going to be a doctor. This is the answer you give every time. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's, you know, you're going to be a lawyer. This is what you say in court and then you win. Now, it doesn't work that way. What you need are skills. If you apply this analysis, if you apply this presentation, if you apply these argumentation techniques, if you do these things and learn these skills, no matter what future you will get into, you will be able to work your way out of it. But this requires that the future is kind of knowable, because I need to know the types of situations you're going to be in, because then I can tweak the skills to those situations. But we're slowly moving into a place where the future is unknowable. You've got something like Elon Musk saying we're going to have a million people on Mars in 50 years. I challenge you to create the curriculum, eight easy steps of living on Mars. <laughs> you know, what, what knowledge are we going to teach them? You know, what skills are we going to teach them? I don't know. No way of knowing that. But some things are timeless. Your life attitude is timeless and your self-awareness is timeless. I call it the, 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 the Rome-Mars test. If we're going to teach our kids something, we want it to be timeless. So how do we know if something's timeless? Well, if something would be useful in ancient Rome, and if it's going to be useful if you're living on Mars, then probably it's reasonably universal, as much as we can kind of figure out, right? So um, knowing the capitals of the state of the US, is it going to be useful in Rome? Not so much. Is it going to be useful on Mars? Not so much. But um, being able to set goals and persevering. Ancient Rome, probably be pretty popular if you're good at setting goals and persevering to reach them and probably on Mars you will still be. If you are sociable, um, if you are perseverant, if you're optimistic, if you like learning, those are all traits that whether we live 2000 years ago or if you're going to learn live on Mars, probably that's going to help you. And actually the right life attitudes and self-awareness will make that you will learn the skills and those will make sure that you get the knowledge that is necessary. So this is one of the things that I truly believe that the education system needs to broaden to cover all these areas. And this actually is what I see in most gifted programs as well. That education as a whole starts out usually with a lot of focus on knowledge and a little bit of skill. And most gifted pro programs start including more uh, skills as they go along, like executive functions and, and cooperation and stuff like that. And recently there's been a lot of focus on stuff like learning a growth mindset um, as an, a skill to or a life attitude to add and adding you know what are your talents knowing what my talents and traits are that's actually pretty useful to know so it's it's broadening the perspective and i like what eric hoffer actually quite a while already said it's uh, in times of change the learners will inherit the earth while the learn nut will find themselves prepared for an earth that no longer exists and that's really something we're moving into right now. The, the, the world is changing faster and faster. Concrete example is, is uh, self-driving cars. Uh, 10 years ago, we couldn't even imagine them ever being real. Now we've got, I think, 17 different car manufacturers all having promised to have them before 2025. So even if like one or two or even five fail, probably one of them is gonna make it. But if we're talking about the US alone, 4.1 million jobs is driving something, where it's a truck or a bus or a taxi or something. 4.1 million people, that job just doesn't exist anymore. And this is the first example, like robotics and artificial intelligence are quickly going to change a lot of things. And, you know, at the start of the industrial age, it took like 40 years to make that transition. Probably now we're going to talk more about four to eight years to make that transition. So what's going to save us? The right life attitude, being aware of what your talents are and having the skills to cope with the world. So broadening the world is probably going to help you if you want to be successful. So there's a lot of background um, to get concrete. How to support gifted kids? You know, if these are their needs, what can we do to help them with that? Well, step one that I almost always advise is psychoeducation. And that's not psychoeducation. <laughs> <laughs> it's psychoeducation. <laughs> teaching them about psychology. Uh, teaching these theories. You know, showing them this presentation for all I care. Um, but sharing these stories attribute value to them. Because if you're gonna say that, well, you know, just memorize your stuff and the rest doesn't matter, then they're not gonna value it either. 
if you're going to say, well, that growth mindset, idiocy, you know, and are you a role model? If we're going to talk about a growth mindset, it's fun to learn new stuff. And you're going to be every time something new happens, oh, I hate learning new stuff. I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm just going to stay the same. Um, then what do you think your kids are going to do? And talk about it. Just have a conversation. You know, do you like learning or don't you like learning? And, and what do you think about perseverance? You know, I think perseverance is important. So if we're going to do that with well-being, um, positive emotions, as much as possible, lessen your reliance on that. Um, because it's like pretty much a direct road to a midlife crisis. Um, because it's such a limited model, inflation occurs really quickly, it doesn't matter how much you give your kids, they're gonna want more. Like the next step is gonna be even more and even more. Like this is a never ending game. It's really never gonna end. Actually we're making it worse by giving them more on an earlier age. Like it used to be that it takes you about 50 years to get everything you ever wanted and probably now most millennials have reached that point by their 20s. And that's why you can have a quarter life crisis. You can do it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So work on engagement. The classical advice in education, differentiate. What are the odds that you've got like 30 kids in front of you and they're all at exactly the same level of math right now? Like that chance is zero. I went to the Davidson Institute, like one of the really cool schools in uh, Reno, and they've got like an extremely differentiated program. They spend a lot of time figuring out like which kid needs to go to what class. And they said every year, the beginning of the year, we've got 150 students, we've got 400 changes in the schedule. So 400 changes from now, you're going to, level, going to go a level up, you're going to go one down. And these are specialists, mind you. I mean, these have been doing it for years. And they need to tweak that much to get the differentiation level right. So it's really important to differentiate as much as possible. And where possible, tie goals to existing engagement. To get a kid to go from flow from nothing, that's pretty challenging. But if a kid themselves, you know, they're, they're playing either a computer game or they're trying to learn car tricks or something like that. Hey. You like learning card tricks? Well, it'd be interesting to see if you can do it with five cards as well, as opposed to with just three. So now we've already got an area they are interested in. Try raising the bar a little bit to make it a little bit more challenging, whatever they're doing. Relationship. For a lot of kids, this is actually the glue that holds them together. Now we were just having a conversation that for some of these kids, you know, summer camp, like a gifted enrichment summer camp, is what gets them through the other 51 weeks. Just one week a year, because there they find out I'm not crazy, there's others like me, and they, they actually like me the way I am. Um, so now I can bear with like 51 weeks of not have, pay, playing like the chameleon. Um, so ideally they don't have to do that, but this really helps them. So get them into special interest groups. Something they're interested in, ideally with peers or like developmental equals, uh, that makes a huge difference. One day a week, even one day a month. There's actually a lot of programs. If you go on websites like Hoagie Gifted or stuff like that, there's a lot of places where you can find them. Probably your coordinator can guide you to a number of programs, especially in California, there's a lot you can find. So really make sure that they connect with others. Adding meaning to their life. Um, Seligman defined meaning as uh, values in action. So what do you value? What do you think is important? I think equality is important. I think action is important. I think the environment is important. Whatever you think is important, put it into action. If you think the environment is important, what can you do for an hour to make the environment better? If you think equality is important, what are you going to do for an hour that's going to make more, create more equality in the world? And if you're working on the values you have and you're doing something with that, that provides meaning with your life. So it starts with a conversation, what do you value? And then what are we gonna do to do something with that? An achievement, um, like in, in Silicon Valley terms, it's defining your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> it's a goal that kind of makes you tingle, makes you think like, ooh, could I do that? That would be awesome, can I? It would be awesome if I could do that. So really strive for the limit of what can I, what can I not do, and then do stuff that. Um, Maureen Nyhart, one of the uh, researchers in Gifted, um, especially towards the twice exceptional kids who are like broad, are not like uniformly developed, um, have some challenge with that, says what's important to add to that is high challenge, low threshold. Um, your kids are all brilliant at picking a really high challenge, but sometimes they pick one that is so high that they can never reach it, or it's going to take weeks or months or years to reach that. So it's, it's okay to have a goal that's years away, 
but then make sure you have steps that are small enough to take right now. Cool, you know, you want to change the world, you want to land on the moon, awesome. What are we going to do this week to make some movement towards that? Because then I can do something about it. Because sitting here and thinking, what is going to get me on the moon tomorrow? Nothing. And then I'm going to be depressed. But if I'm going to think like, what can I do right now? I could read a book about spaceships. That I could do, cool. Or I can make a mini rocket, or I could find out what fuel they're using, whatever. I can do a little thing that's going to guide me in that direction. So this is a number of things you could do to add to well-being. On the other hand, success, knowledge, skills, life attitude, and self-awareness. Um, the knowledge bit, I don't think it's the most important thing. On the other hand, um, our system is really designed around this. Uh, the standardized tests are designed around this. Um, it's probably to a large degree going to determine if your kid's going to get into you know, the college, university, or whatever he wants to. So, um, if you're going to value it, value it as early as possible in life. Uh, because what I'm in a very general sense seeing, and I don't know if that's the case in this specific school, but that um, we start to value memorization less early in school, because we're like, well, it's actually not that important. You see, you see a lot of primary schools or, or you know, K-8 schools, like, well, we should work more on skills and life attitude and stuff like that. But the problem is that we're for a while not going to train their memorization skills. But then when they're 15, we're going to say, but you need to know how to do it anyway. But then we haven't practiced it. Like if we've practiced it for eight years and at 15, they can do it. But if they're 15 and they never really memorized anything, and when they're 15, it's going to be the first time they have to do it. Of course, 15 is the ideal age to tell a student that they need to do something completely different and that we as adults know that that's good for them and then they're going to listen, right? That's 15 best age to do it. No, of course not. They're not going to listen to you anymore. So they need to make that shift way before then. So if they're going to go onto a path of, of classical education that's going to require standardized testing, practice their skill of memorization early on. For the rest, well, I call it like 80-20, make sure that you learn the most important things, skip the rest. And as a general tip, uh, learn speed reading. Like this is the thing that helped me the most in my life. Speed reading to go through a lot of materials. And somebody once gave me a tip, stuck with me for the rest of my life. I'd rather speed read five books on a topic than read one book it, at a regular speed. And uh, what I would like to add to that is combine those two. First, speed read five books to know which one you should read and then read it slowly. But then you've got more perspective from more different authors. And then pick the book that is actually worthy of being read you know, from cover to cover and then read that one. Skills. Uh, the most important skills that I find with gifted kids that make the difference are what they call the executive skills. Um, it, we've got different parts of our brain and the prefrontal part of our brain is kind of like the director or the coordinator of the rest of the brain. And that helps us regulate the rest of the brain. It makes sure that like you guys are doing a really good job of sitting still and listening. Like that, need, that means that you're suppressing all kinds of primal tendencies right now, <laughs> which is a good thing, helps with sociable behavior and stuff like that. But that needs to be trained. If you've never done that, you don't know how to do it. Here again comes a challenge for gifted kids, because some kids have never focused more than two minutes, because they've never had a problem that was worthy of more than two minutes of their attention. But that might pose a challenge in the future, because if they do get a challenge that's going to take 10 minutes, they lack the physical skill of sitting still for 10 minutes, of focusing their brain for 10 minutes, simply because they've never done it. Same with emotion regulation, uh, planning, uh, task initiation is one of them. Task initiation is the, the time it takes from the moment you start with something and the moment that you're actually doing it and doing that like in an organized fashion. Um, I, or, I, I tape a number of my presentations and I take out all these pieces. The most popular like little piece of clip ever was uh, my kid's got an IQ of 145 but he can't clean up his own room because <laughs> so many parents could relate to that. <laughs> like it's not rocket science cleaning up your room but somehow it doesn't work and why is that? A lack of task initiation. As soon as more than two steps are required to get anything done, they get lost in the process and they get drawn divergent brain going somewhere um, and then they don't know how to finish it. Uh, probably as a parent you might have had like, the doing the things in the right order challenge by a kid screaming, mom, running around naked, completely wet through the house saying, where are the towels? <laughs> as opposed to thinking first you get the towel and then you get into the shower as opposed to the other way around. 
Um, so this all has to do with executive skills, uh, learning to regulate yourself. This also is a social emotional skill, or mostly a social skill. Can I suppress my first thing that I want to say for maybe something that's mildly wiser to say? <laughs> some things that maybe would be better left unsaid. Because some of these kids will actually hear themselves say it as they're thinking it, as opposed to first thinking it and then deciding if it's a good idea to say it and then saying it. Life attitude, um, well, you, we could talk all day about this. Uh, growth mindset, so joy of learning, if <laughs> learned optimism, um, hopefulness, so setting a goal and <laughs> having faith, bless you, having the faith that you will uh, reach it, and self-awareness. Um, a lot of our school system tends to compare our kids with an average student. We've created this, this mythical virtual average student and we're gonna say, you know, you are seven years old and four months. So you, in theory, should have one year and four educational months. That's, you know, 14 educational months. So this is what an average kid should be able to do at that point. As if there are actually kids that are exactly at that point, at that point. And if kids completely, equally develop in all levels at the same time. It's actually not a whole lot of people that do that. And you know, when you're working, people probably pr appreciate for you. Wow, you're analytical. And they're not going to say, well, you're, you know, your languages aren't all that. Well, you're an engineer or the other way around. You know, you're a writer, you're not analytical. We're happy with that. They're not going to say, you know, well, oh, um, you're an engineer, but let's first do like three years of language classes. So you really fine tune that part. But it is what we do in ed education. And often we judge our kid by their worst grade as opposed to, you know, celebrating their best part. So what are your, your positive sides? So what are your talents? One of the quotes I really like by Martin Seligman is, um, you should spend your life living your signature strengths and you should work enough on your weaknesses so they don't hinder you in that process. So that's a very specific definition. You know, work on your talents, design your life around your talents and make sure that your weaknesses aren't in your way. So this could be working on your executive skills, by the way. It doesn't mean that your executive skills have to be the best in the world. But if you can't focus for more than a minute, then probably you can't be like a physics string theorist. Like that is not going to coincide. So if that's your weakness, you have to learn how to focus enough so you can be that physicist you want to be or that entrepreneur you want to be. But then you've got a reason. It's not the goal itself, but it's to make sure that you can do what you want to do. And in this entire process, the constant question is, should, should school be changed or should the student be changed? Well, 100 years ago, the answer was really clear. School is the way it is, we're gonna fit students into the school. That had quite a number of disadvantages. We lost a lot of talent that way. In some cases, lately, we might have gone a little bit far in the other direction. That school is kind of like the extended staff you know, you've got your house cleaner, you've got your babysitter, you've got your teacher, and you need to have like good discussions with them so they do what you want them to do. Um, that, that's kind of like pushing it, but sometimes we are asking a lot of schools. Uh, with limited funding, with a lot of students, they need to do a lot of stuff. And the question is, is it helping the students? Because we might risk, and maybe some of you have seen this at the Olympics, that we turn into this. And that's actually not just for the parents, but for schools as well. Um, this is curling. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like sliding a disc over the ice. And then there's two people running in front with little brooms and like smoothing the way as they go. So this is us with our kids. You know, we put a disc on the ice and then the teacher and the, and the parent will go in front of the disc and like smoothen the entire ride. And it works. The disc goes further that way. But the disc goes further that way because we take all the obstacles away. And I don't know what your life looks like, but my life is full of obstacles. And why can I take the big obstacles in my life? Because I had little obstacles when I was a little kid. And that's a learning process dealing with the obstacles. So no obstacles may make for a longer ride in the beginning, but for a weaker kid in the end. And the challenge is to train them in such a way that they can deal with the challenges as they come. Because otherwise you might risk some challenge with what you call the attribution style. The attribution style is about who do you blame when things go wrong or right. So say <clears throat> I'm successful, I get a high grade. I could attribute it to myself. Wow, you know, check me get an A+. Plus. Or I could say, well, you know, I was lucky because it was an easy test and, you know, it was an easy subject and stuff like that. Same when things go wrong. I get a failing grade, I can say, oh no, 
I did something wrong. It's the worst thing in the world. Or I can think, well, I couldn't help it. I mean, my teacher made a stupid test. Like, what can I do? So who are you going to blame? And that creates kind of like four different options. If you're always going to attribute it to the world or someone else, you're going to be a victim. Because sometimes you're happy because they make easy tests and sometimes you're, you've got bad luck because they made a stupid test for you. But most likely, a lot of kids go one of the other extreme. A martyr, when things go well, they're like, oh, you know, couldn't help it. You know, it was an easy test. But when things go wrong, they're like, oh no, I did something wrong. You know, it tends to be a perfectionist. The narcissists do exactly the opposite. They're like, when they get an A+, they're like, you know, check out my A+. Oh no, that's failing grade. Well, that was a stupid test and that was a teacher's fault and somebody interacted. And like, oh, it's all somebody else's. But what we would like to have is whether they get an A plus or whether they get a failing grade to attribute to yourself. What can I do to make things better? What can I do to improve things? And that's actually a much more healthy way of dealing with obstacles. And that can be anything. It could be a failing grade, but it could also be a lack of friendships. I mean, we have to be empathic with kids. It's really, it's really hard if you don't have friends. What can you do to make things better? What can we do to help you with it? Because we can point at, you know, the world is unfair and there's not enough gifted and nobody understands it and nobody understands me and nobody understands you. But is that going to help? Is that going to make it better? What are you going to do to make things better and how can I help you? I can get you to a camp, but you have to pick it out. I can get you to other people. Like, you don't know how to approach people. Let's get a book. Let's ask somebody. What can we do to make things better and how can we train that? How can we train the skills that go with it? So again, step one, psychoeducation. Explain it, talk about it, attribute value to it and be that role model. You know, don't go around blaming, you know, oh, my boss did this and he did that and everybody's unfair in the world. Well, then don't be surprised if your kid starts saying the same kind of things um, and talk about it. The last thing, or at least the last thing that I'm gonna quickly address and then I really wanna go to questions and see what you guys wanna talk about. Um, is about stage appropriate teaching and, and parenting. And what do I mean by that? Um, this is kind of like the elaborate version. I'm gonna save you guys this, because <laughs> this is really theoretical. Um, this is uh, Ken Wilber's model uh, of integral lines and levels. It's different developmental lines from, for instance, your cognitive developmental line uh, to your uh, moral development line, your ego needs, your emotional development. So we've got all these different parts of us that can develop. Our tendency is to see the kid as one whole. You know, you are developed at this level, but there's virtually nobody who is completely synchronous. Almost everybody is asynchronous, like this area is really developed, this maybe a little bit less, and that goes back and forth. And what turns out to be that the further out of the average you are, the bigger the asynchronicity is going to be. That's just statistics, kind of one-on-one -on -one that it makes sense that they get further apart. And within each of these areas, we can make it really complicated, but like the simple way of looking at it is that there's three stages of development. You've got the pre-conventional level, the conventional level, and the post-conventional level. So what do I mean by that? So say, for instance, you're, um, you're learning how to create art. You're learning how to paint. The first step you're in is pre-conventional. You have no idea how to do it. You have no idea how to do it. You just do something. Then the next step is going to be that you're going to get to the conventional stage. You learn the techniques, you learn how it's done, you learn how to control yourself, you know what, what to do with it. And some people, after they reach the conventional stage, reach the post-conventional stage. You got like the impressionists, for instance. They said, well, and actually a lot of impressionists could do really good realistic paintings. But then they said, I've got an even better way than realism to show reality. And that's this way. This is the way I look at the world. That's post-conventional. They could do the conventional, but they went beyond it. Challenge is what um, Ken Wilber called the pre-post fallacy. And the pre-post fallacy is that sometimes it's hard to distinguish the pre-conventional level from the post-conventional level. Um, at Sotheby's, uh, one of the international um, auction houses, they auctioned off a three-year-old's painting for 65,000 pounds. Um, and that was because it was accompanied by an art critic's description of the deep thoughts that the artist must have had <laughs> while creating that painting. And that's a pre-post fallacy because the kid definitely didn't have those thoughts. Um, those were attributed by somebody else. It's just sometimes something that looks beyond conventional. It's not conventional anymore, so it looks different. 
but the difference is, is it very intentionally different or is it just randomly different? And that is what you see with gifted in some of the cases. There's this disharmony and there's this fallacy because most often, cognitively, they're post-conventional. They know how to think logically and they know how to like, think almost beyond um, logically. But if you talk about, for instance, ego development or even moral development, sometimes they're pre-conventional. They don't even know how it's done. They don't know how to control themselves. But they will tell a cognitive story to go with it. But um, like one of, if you talk about moral development, Kohlberg has written a lot about this. And the pre-conventional level could be best described if, um, if you weren't caught, you weren't wrong. Like that's like the moral development level. Um, it's a pretty risky combination with being really smart. Because you're really good at not getting caught. But then you falsely start believing if you're at that ego development level, you were never wrong either. And the, the way you guide kids is so different at each of these levels. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, exactly like I said, they're post-conventional cognitive, but self-regulation, maybe they're not post-conventional. And for instance, when we're going to do a project, a project, like the conventional approach is to have a step-by-step -step process. You know, we're going to do this project for eight weeks and first you write the title and then you're going to make a summary and you're going to do all these things. So now the kid comes up to you and says, oh man, all those steps, I'm beyond that. You know, I, I don't do those steps. I'm, I'm, my mind is way beyond this. I want to just, I want to just intuitively go for it. And you're like, wow, cool. You know, this kid is post-conventional. He's beyond the point of needing these kind of step-by-step -step approaches. Well, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the, the tasting. If the kid comes after four weeks with a brilliant piece of work, then yes, he's post-conventional because he didn't need the step-by-step -step approach and comes up with a brilliant intuitive approach. But if after four weeks he didn't even get a pencil on the paper because he doesn't know where to start, then probably he's pre-conventional because he doesn't even know how to, how to regularly do it, let alone, to, let alone to go beyond it. But he's using his post-conventional cognitive skills, his smartness, to try to get away with it. To try to describe it as though he's post-conventional, but that's just a way to get freedom. I just want less limitations. So this is a, a challenge with kids to see like where are they post and where are they pre-conventional or conventional and how to help them. Because sometimes also kids are conventional, you need to pull them beyond that. No, you don't need a step-by-step -step approach. You've done it like 10 times with a step-by-step -step approach. You're going to do it without because you need to figure out how to be without the steps. That could be a step as well. So at the pre-conventional stage, you know, the world view is if I wasn't caught, I wasn't wrong. And at the conventional stage, I am trying to find out what the right way is. Just teach me how to do it. But the approach is completely different. At a post-conventional level, it comes like what gives the best result for all. So it becomes much more a goal-oriented approach. So when I start trying to parent or teach one of these kids, at a pre-conventional level, it's really important to have clear consequences. Because they don't oversee the consequences themselves. They somehow tend to not really live towards them. So we need to make sure that when they're wrong, they're caught. They get feedback. But when they're in the conventional state, they don't need it anymore. They just need clear rules. This is what I expect of you. And this is when you are or when you're not adhering to that. This is what goes wrong in a number of high schools, for instance. The beginning of high school is, okay, you know, kids, um, you're all here. Awesome, your students now. These are the five rules that are here. Questions, no questions, let's go. Because high school is assuming if I'm clear about my rules and the students are conventional, they will execute them. But then you've got this one kid who's raised his hands like, what happens if I don't abide by the rules? So he's actually asking a pre-conventional question, what are the consequences? And if there are no consequences, well then probably there weren't any rules to begin with, right? <laughs> then it's a preference on your end. Um, so here we see a disconnect. Some kids actually don't make it past the pre-conventional self-regulation state. And this is one of the biggest things that makes a difference in success in gifted kids. Uh, some of you might know the uh, marshmallow test. Have you ever heard of that? It's one of the most sadistic psychological experiments ever conceived. You take a six-year-old, you put him in front of the table, and you say, here's one marshmallow, and if you leave it on the table for 10 minutes, you're going to get a second one. And the question is, can the kid control himself for that period? Well, given a relatively same range of IQs, uh, this has a huge predictor for academic success. Kids who can leave the marshmallow are way more likely to be successful 
throughout their school career and in their working career than the ones that could not. So that self-regulation bit is really important. The challenge is that um, as guidance therapists, as parents, um, we often approach it post-conventional. We discuss the end result and we appeal to empathy. I would feel really happy if you would just get to this end result. Oh, you didn't do it. That makes me really sad. And then, you know, the pre-conventional kid is, okay, good for you. Because <laughs> uh, as a parent and educator, um, each stage thinks it's the only way. The post-conventional stage tends to think the only way to parent is post-conventional. And the only way a teacher tends to be, if he's post-conventional, is teaching post-conventional. So what we do is we apply our level onto the children. Because we're post-conventional, we will do post-conventional interventions, regardless of whether the kid is or is not post-conventional. Same for a conventional teacher, by the way. It's where some gifted kids get stuck as well. They're post-conventional while their teacher is still conventional. It's really important that we take the responsibility of measuring up to their level. What do you right, need right now? What's your interaction? So this is where I see that, that sometimes, especially gifted parents often, and, and teachers will tend to be in this last phase, uh, tend to st stick pretty long to this, while some kids might need one of these. But we hate this. <laughs> This is no fun. I don't do this anymore. All these stupid rules and consequences, I don't like them. <coughs> so why would I give them to my kid? Well, because my kid is at a developmental level where he needs them. So this tends to clear up a lot of things in, um, in parenting. So some things that I'm working on and what I'm doing in English and where to find me. Um, one of the other presentations I often do, but it's very much aimed at, at didactics or, or how to teach or how to work with education, is the seven challenges of gifted children. Um, we look, talk, look at the beliefs, so for instance, a growth mindset, learning how to use your memory, how to motivate kids, doing prolonged focused work, how to cooperate with others, big challenge for some gifted kids, how to deal with frustration tolerance, and how to deal with knowledge gaps. Uh, sometimes they accrue knowledge gaps because they speed through materials without like automation or stuff like that and it's really important to be mindful of that. Um, I gave this presentation by the way um, at the Davidson um, Institute and recorded it so I'll see if I can add the link to that presentation as well if, if you want to see it and you could look at that as well. Um, one of my real big interests is how to support twice exceptional kids so they're like usually in the upper bound in one area, but maybe in a lower bound in another. And a big discussion that's going on there is, um, is there actual twice exceptionality? So can you be, for instance, gifted and be on the autistic spectrum at the same time? Or is this misdiagnosis? And my belief is that it's both possible. Some kids are misdiagnosed. They say, you know, this kid has ADD or this kid, you know, is on the autism spectrum, but he's just gifted and he's just in a really bad environment and that's why he's acting out and then somebody's coming with a score list and then they say he's got some kind of disability. Might not be the case. On the other hand, I've definitely seen kids that do have these challenges. And for that, I've created um, this model. Um, is like, where is it coming from? Because nine out of 10 diagnoses are made by looking at the behavior. If you act like somebody with AD, ADD, you have ADD but it might just be motivation. Um, there was a kid, actually, true story, in a classroom, and he was diagnosed as having um, Asperger's, so he was on the autism spectrum disorder scale. And when working with him, it was really weird because it was only in the classroom. Like, only when he was in school, he saw all these behaviors. When he was at home, it wasn't there. When he was with other kids and his friends, it wasn't there. So we had a talk with him, and he was explaining that this was just motivated behavior. He was bullied a lot. And then they had like this kid who did have autism in his classroom. They bullied him once and he like freaked out threw stuff through the classroom and started acting really weird. Nobody bullied him ever again. So he's like, hey, this is a cool strategy, it works. So he just started copying the kid and he was never bullied again. It worked. He actually could get out of every assignment that way too. He just had some kind of a fit and he didn't have to do it anymore. He's like, this is cool. And this is a really extreme example, but sometimes it's motivated behavior. Sometimes they lack the skills. For instance, ADD cannot have prolonged attention. 
um, might be that they just never trained prolonged focused attention. Um, it could be your beliefs. Um, somebody who is, you know, they, 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 to yeah, they told me I've got ADD, so I cannot concentrate. He would never try. He put no effort into it whatsoever because somebody had told him he wasn't able to do it. But when he trained it, he was able to do it because it turned out that when he's playing a computer game, he could brilliantly focus for 45 minutes. And they were like, well, we can translate that to something else as well. And he was like, oh, wow, who knew? <laughs> so it was just his beliefs. And these are all pretty changeable. This is not like you're physically changed. This becomes more physical. Some kids have allergies or have food related things. Uh, so for instance, if you've got like a big zinc deficiency, you might show problems in communications. So those, there are some very specific things that could cause a behavior that looks like, but if you change your diet, that might resolve quite a number of issues. Some things are linked with what they call pruning periods. So your brain develops in phases and every phase is like an optimal phase to learn something. Um, so if, for instance, your executive functions and skills, if you haven't learned them before the age of 18, um, then it becomes a lot harder to train, train them. So you could train them prob probably in like 10 hours when you're between 8 and 10. But if you want to have the same amount of gain when you're 25, you probably would have to train 200 or 300 hours. So you've got periods that your brain is more sensitive to certain learning standards. And then you get to brain physiology. Yes, there's something called HDD, where you've got like the re-uptake inhibiting process of a neurotransmitter that's actually working or not working. And that is where the medication will work. The medication is actually not meant for all the other things. So it's really important to zoom into that. And that's what we're trying to do to figure out like what are all these different levels on all these different areas. Um, we talked a little bit about asynchronous development. Well, you can really zoom into that by looking at like ego development, needs and drives development, like at every level and creating a psychograph. So a complete graph of every level, every line. No, not a psychograph, but a psychograph. Um, so how, how, what does that look like? Um, the book I'm writing right now is A Bright Future for Our Bright Minds. So that was a little bit that we talked about, you know, the knowledge, the skills, life attitude. Like, in what ways is the world changing and what could you do as a parent and as an educator to change that? Um, I'm going to give a presentation pretty, clo co um, <coughs> pretty soon at the conference uh, of the California Association of the Gifted in a week and a half about this theme. And well, I'm setting up the school to see like how far can we take this? Um, if you apply all these things, if you develop software to help with that, so to really do the portfolio learning and stuff like that, try to approach it from as many levels as possible. So what I try to do again, the overview, I try to give a bunch of practical tips as well, stuff that you could try out, cherry pick, uh, see if what you can find. Um, the next place I'm going to be at is the uh, California Association of the Gifted. It's a really cool conference. It's going to be in San Diego uh, this year. Uh, it's going to be not this week. Uh, actually, this, yeah, this Friday to Sunday. Sunday is Parent Day. Uh, so if you're going to come, that would be the most logical day for you. And there I will be happily presenting as well. Um, and I hope this was valuable for you guys. We're going to do some questions. Um, if so, what I would really like to ask you is if you can help me mostly by spreading the word. I'm going to send you this video and the materials. If you know somebody else who might be interested, just please forward it. Just make sure that other people get exposed to this stuff as well. Um, and let me know your questions. And if you can't come up with them now, um, you know, feel free to email me or send them on Twitter or something or on Facebook and I'll find some way uh, to answer you guys. I hope it's valuable and I'm very curious what your questions are so we can continue the conversation. Thank you.